My subject this morning is uh, U.S. policy and biodiversity science uh, at the national and international levels. I am by no means an expert in this area. Uh, most of what I am presenting stems from uh, personal experience and personal involvement and uh, one can be uh, complimentary and call it anecdotal at best. Uh, I am not a policy wonk um, and uh, there are other folks like Jorge uh, and, and Vanderlei and, and, and Town who uh, perhaps even have better knowledge of this than I do. But from my perspective, U.S. policy and, and having biodiversity science translate into U.S. policy nationally and internationally is a confusing mess. Why do I say that? In general, U.S. science policy, one can consider is determined by the Office of Science and Technology Policy which is not a cabinet position, but which does report directly to uh, President Obama. It's headed by the President's science advisor. It establishes the scientific goals and policy for U.S. government action. And it works through a number of different U.S. agencies. One major one is the National Academy of Sciences which conducts studies into all areas of science and advises the president on what further knowledge is needed and what kind of policies that they recommend should be enacted on the best science available at that time. The Office of Science and Technology Policy also works through the federal funding agencies that fund basic research into the natural sciences and the human health sciences. Specifically here, the National Science Foundation, which funds all of basic science in the United States, the National Institutes of Health, which funds uh, biomedical science, uh, and also the OSTP works through regulatory agencies, all of whom also have research units. This can get very confusing. So for example, the Environmental Protection Agency, and note I have this green dot here, this green asterisk, which denotes the regulatory agencies which regulate uh, laws uh, <clears throat> and regulations around the United States dealing with that particular agency. But each one of these also has research units that deal with biodiversity and its impacts. Department of Interior, as National Parks, U.S. Geological Survey, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Agriculture, uh, specifically the U.S. Forest Service, and the Center for Disease Control uh, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. All have, although they're regulatory agencies, all have also research units that, whose research findings eventually trickle up uh, to the Office of Science and Technology Policy and help determine science policy for the United States. Let's take a close look at one of the funding agencies, the National Science Foundation. It funds basic science research in the biological sciences, geological sciences, physical sciences, that is atmospherical sciences and, and astronomy. Uh, in engineering, behavioral and social sciences, the Arctic sciences, computational sciences, and in science education. It's the results of all this research inform science policy via the Congress and via the regulatory agencies. The National Science Foundation also funds long-term observatories. These are platforms like the Long-Term Ecological Research Network and what is being built out now, NEON, the National Ecological uh, <coughs> um, uh, Observatory Network. These are platforms to sense both, both the abiotic and the biotic environments and uh, uh, show long-term trends in, in both and how they affect one another. 
National Science Foundation also funds an Antarctic research station, which is an international research station, which uh, I believe uh, South Africa owns a chunk of, as does Argentina, New Zealand, and I think one or two other countries. Uh, the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, and NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, 20 sites that is now being built out. All of these contribute research results that in one way or another trickle up to informing science policy via Congress and via legislation. The National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. uses the results of its research and everybody else's research to advise governments and agencies. So the President or the Congress can ask the National Academy of Sciences, please do a study on the impact of global climate change on, and say on U.S. agriculture in the next 10 years. Or please do a study on uh, the health of U.S. water systems um, with say runoff from agricultural fertilizers and on and on and on. So here are some examples of what uh, the National Academy of Sciences has recently been working on. Sustainable water and environmental management in the California Bay Delta. Defining and advancing the conceptual basis of biological science for the 21st century. In other words, how should we be teaching and doing science in the 21st century? Emerging research questions in the Arctic, a great deal of that refers to climate change in the Arctic because that's going to be one of the most severely affected areas of the globe with climate change. And a national strategy for advancing climate modeling. These are very, very uh, topical uh, issues that the National Academy is advising the OSTP and the President and Congress of the United States for legislation. So they don't determine policy, but they provide the best science and recommendations for the kinds of policy that might be enacted. Here's an example of one of the regulatory agencies, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA. EPA develops and enforces regulations on air, water, soil pollutants, on changing climates, like CO2, uh, <clears throat> on human health, the effect of, say, CO2 on human health, or the effect of uh, certain water uh, pollutants on human health, pesticides in food, hydraulic fracking, which is now consuming the globe, and there's great questions about how it affects the water supply, whether it's actually lubricating earthquakes or er earthquake fault zone, zones or not, and lead and mercury levels, and, and so forth. So here's an example of, from cradle to grave, how, envir how environmental policy and biodiversity policy occurs with one regulatory agency and with one issue. An example is climate change and carbon dioxide. Up until a few years ago, the EPA did not regulate carbon dioxide levels in the air because it did not have the legislative, direct legislative mandate to do so. But the National Academy, after a study, advised on the CO2 threat. And it took this from NSF funded research, IPCC research, and so forth. So the president, via OSTP, asked the EPA to make a rule, which the EPA is allowed to do, to regulate CO2 levels under the existing Clear, Clean Air Act. The U.S. has a Clean Air Act, which is enforced by the EPA. So under that Clean Air Act, the President asked EPA to regulate levels of, car of, excuse me, of carbon dioxide. So the EPA promulgated a rule, a regulation, that was published, has to be published for public comment in the Federal Register for a certain number of days, 30 days, 90 days, 120 days. And at the same time, EPA administrators are called in front of Congress and congressional committees where they are quizzed and have to answer questions about 
this rule, proposed rule? What will it serve? How will it affect the economy? Is EPA overstepping its bounds? How do you answer, critici answer criticisms about it being anti-business? And so on and so on and so on. According to the feedback from Congress and from the public, the rule is then modified and then enacted by the Environmental Protection Agency. Congress may not agree with the rule. Indeed, it did not in this case. So it introduced legislation to nullify the rule and nullify EPA having control of CO2 regulation in the air. However, in Congress, the rule was defeated, giving EPA the authority to now include CO2 levels under the Clean Air Act. Then Massachusetts sued, a state sued, because it had its own regulations and it didn't want to follow the federal regulations. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. It took years. And it, this is basically challenging whether EPA had the right and ability to regulate greenhouse gases, like CO2. And the Supreme Court ruled that under the law, EPA, and under EPA's charter, it did indeed have that authority. So then, finally, the rule went into effect. So, from science to policy is not a straight shot. It goes through many different layers of bureaucracy, of comment, of conflict, between special interests, Congress, um, and the public. And I'm sure it's the same in each one of your countries. Not only can the states challenge rules, but both industry groups and environmental groups frequently challenge EPA on its final rules and frequently challenge all the other regulatory agencies on their rules, like the Endangered Species Act. Another regulatory agency is the Department of Interior, which is responsible for most U.S. biodiversity uh, policy uh, on U.S. lands. Um, a great deal of land and biodiversity is protected through the auspices of the national parks, national forests, national monuments, all of which are under the Department of Interior. And the Department of Interior issues biodiversity regulations under the Endang Endangered Species Act, which it regulates. Okay, so switching from the national scene to the international scene. From my experience, most of US and international science policy is governed by the State Department because it is the State Department that negotiates the international treaties, such as the Treaty of the Sea, all the conventions, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, CITES, IPCC, IPBES, and so forth. This is the province of the State Department. And so at all these, on all the meetings of all of these groups, uh, it is the State Department that is the official representative for the United States. It also is responsible for international regulations, such as the Lacey Act. All right, so what are the hurdles in international science policy? Let's look at academia first. Academia is a, at least in my experience in U.S. academia, is a very poor training ground for training the next generation of, uh, of, of students and the next generation of scientists to translate science to policy and science to politics. We are not trained and we don't do a good job training our students in how to translate their research results for the public and for politicians. 
on what it means, on the significance of research results to uh, policy deliberations. And we are not very good at training and teaching our students to make the connections between research that they are doing and both short-term and long-term societal implications. I was telling Kate the other day that one of the standard questions we ask when we recruit new faculty members and we bring in three of them to give a talk and then we interview them and one of the standard interview questions is if a Kansas legislator or let's say if it's Kenya, if a 